Hello, good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7 here at Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Donald C. Stewart and once again we're here in order to discuss a variety of issues that have arisen during the course of the last 24 hours plus that are important to Scotland and indeed the common weal of those of us who believe that a Scottish perspective is important and one of the people who is joining me uh, from his home is Paul McLennan, uh, East Lothian MSP. Paul, delighted to have you with us once again, a contributor that we see often enough to know that you are a great friend to the programme. So thanks for joining us. Good evening. So as we always do, we begin this evening with day 384 of the Ukrainian update. And as I was saying on Sunday when I was here, this of course is a, a variety of fairly um, stark messages that come out from a dark place where one country is being invaded by another. But there are people at the heart of all this, but we don't start with a person. We start with news today that a Russian Su-27 fighter jet collided with a US military drone over the Black Sea, causing the drone to crash, according to the United States military. The American MQ-9 Reaper drone and two Su-27 flanker jets conducting a routine operation in international airspace when one of the Russian jets intentionally flew in front of and dumped fuel in front of that unmanned drone. White House, sp White House spokesperson John Kirby called the intercept unsafe and unprofessional. Russia and Ukraine are at odds over the length of the extension of the Black Sea grain deal with Moscow, seeking to extend for 60 days, and Ukraine insisting that double that, 122, 120 days, is the minimum permitted extension. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin addressed workers at an aviation factory where he said the survival of a Russian statehood was at stake in the Ukraine. Polish Prime Minister Matthias Morawiecki has said that his country would supply Ukraine with MiG fighter jets in the coming four to six weeks. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov has said today that Russia does not recognise the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Ukraine's Defence Ministry has claimed its forces have killed over 700 Russian troops in the last 24 hours. The UK Ministry of Defence has said that Russian artillery ammunition shortages have likely worsened in recent weeks to the extent that extremely punitive shell rationing is in force on many parts of the front. Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson said today that the likelihood that Finland would join the NATO military alliance before Sweden had increased, although Swedish membership was only a matter of time. And in Russia, Russia's lower house of parliament, the state Duma, has backed an amendment that would punish those found guilty of discrediting volunteer groups fighting in Ukraine, in a move that would include fighters working for the private mercenary Wagner Group. Lithuania's parliament voted unanimously today to designate Russian's Wagner mercenary group a terrorist organisation. And the Italian government has said that the Russian mercenary group is behind a surge in migrant boats trying to cross the central Mediterranean as part of Moscow's strategy to retaliate against countries supporting Ukraine. Serbian economic minister Radi Basta has called for sanctions to be imposed against Russia. Basta said that Serbia, which has traditionally had a close relationship with Russia, had paid a high price for having delayed. And I suppose, Paul, that as I started this, it's a very human story at the same time filled with lots of statistics and numbers and so on. But it is um, certainly one where international resolve does not seem to have been lessened by the tactics that the Russians have been employing. But this Wagner group seems to be a very sinister group of individuals and if they're involved in migrant boats in Italy this has now got a wider implication for the rest of Europe. Yeah I think it's concerning their, their behaviour over the last number of months uh, and last year or so increasingly is becoming you know more worrisome. Um, I, I, the Russians generally I don't think are following the, the I suppose the ethics of, of warfare and um, we, we've seen a, a soldier shot in 
and, and cold blood last last week. Um, and I think this week, you know, the, the Wagner uh, group, I, I don't think, you know, even apply those those low standards. So it, it is concerning if they and if they are obviously then going into people trafficking, you know, to try and raise funds. That that's really concerning uh, in terms of that. There's no morals attached to these people whatsoever. Absolutely. And uh, back home today, Audit Scotland have raised concerns over the Ferguson Marine Shipyard. A new report by them has expressed concerns over the final costs and completion dates of the two delayed Lifeline ferries. That's Glen Sanox, known as 801, and Vessel 802. Concerns were also raised over the payment of performance bonuses to senior managers at the shipyard. The report said that in total the two vessels are currently estimated to cost £293 million, with delivery already five years late. Despite additional Scottish Government funding in 2022-23 and 2023-24, the latest estimates suggest there is around £9.5 million of funding required for the ferries beyond the amount already approved. Audit Scotland also said that they had doubts about the longer-term viability of the Ferguson Marine Port Glasgow, the FMPG shipyard, despite sustained investment by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government, meanwhile, has ensured, assured sorry, FMPG there will be financial support for at least another year, enabling delivery of both vessels 801 and 802. Approval for this is needed from the Scottish Parliament, however. Further investment in the shipyard and workforce are also needed to help secure future contracts. Responding to the Audit Scotland report, Ferguson Marine CEO, the Chief Executive Operating Officer, David Tideman said the current Board of Directors and the Remuneration Committee have accepted the feedback from the Auditor General of Scotland with regard to performance incentives paid to senior managers for the financial year to end March 2022. In relation to the completion of the two ferries, Mr Tideman said, We appreciate the points Mr Boyle is making regarding the completion of the ferries funding gap, given that the shipyard is funded by public money. However, it is important to understand that the gap he identifies is largely to cover increased contingency expenditure recommended by independent experts appointed by the Scottish Government, as well as funding for additional warranty spend that may arise in the 12 months after we hand over the vessels. I would stress that the construction costs to build both vessels are not a major contributing factor to this funding cap. FMPG is largely holding to the budget submitted in September 2022 to complete construction. Mr Tideman went on to add, looking ahead post-delivery of the two LNG hulls, we believe there is a strong future for the yard based on two visible pipelines, winning further shipbuilding contracts for CMAL as well as contracts for BAE to support its T26 frigate programme by building modules within the yard ready for assembly at its governed shipyard. We already have some FMPG staff seconded to govern and the arrangement is working well. Ferguson Marine said that they intend to submit a strong bid for CMAL's small vessel replacement programme, the SVRP, and believe that they are well placed to win this contract, given their experience of exactly this type of work in the past. Paul, I think um, this has been bubbling away in the background, and if I can connect it a little to what we've been talking about thus far, there are people employed here, there are people and jobs on the line, and it's an area that has managed to have a degree of economic regeneration. So the investment that the Scottish Government have been trying to put in there is attempting in some way to provide a future for this uh, very proud shipyard area, very proud shipbuilding area uh, for the future, which sometimes kind of gets lost in it all, does it not? Yeah, it does get lost in it. I mean, I've spoken in debates and been interviewed on various other TV channels as well around about this particular matter. And the one thing you have to remind people is that this affects the area. Um, it affects the psyche of the area. And as you said, because I think obviously it's been proud shipbuilding area for a long period of time. And most importantly, it affects people's lives. This is their livelihood in terms of that. So I think that, that that's something we should always have 
to the forefront of, of, of you know, for, for discussions when we're, we're looking at this. I think there are a few key things, as you mentioned, I think obviously we need to look at the future viability of the yard and future prosperity of the yard. I think that's important. And we need to learn lessons from what's going on in the past and what's going on just now to ensure that the yard's in the best place uh, possible to, to win to win new contracts, to give it that long-term viability. And that's that's a really important part. And, and, and again, you know, coming back to the, the bonus payments, it, it's concerning that the, the, the management didn't think that, that this was worth men mentioning to the Scottish government concerning what's what's going on. And and I think you're right. And the, the final point, probably done before for myself, is the contingency you mentioned of about nine point five billion, nine point five million pound. I'm not overly surprised when you look at construction um, inflation over the last year or so. Um, inflation has normally been ten percent. Construction inflation has probably been around about double that, about twenty percent. Um, so there's a statement uh, by the, the government on Thursday, so we'll find out more uh, around about that then. And you know, hopefully we can we can move on, get the ships completed, get a full order book, move on, and, and secure that long term future for the for the area and the people who work there. That's the most important thing. I think also broadly in terms of the Scottish government, one of the things that they have, whether it be Prestwick Airport, whether it be Scott Rail, whether it be the machine. Sorry, the, the, the marine shipyard. What they have been, in a sense, is bold enough to step in and take some kind of responsibility rather than allowing what were a laughing late times called market forces to decide that, you know, this is how we are going to allow the economy to run. And we see also the Scottish Government this week, in terms of the teacher strikes, being in a position where they've managed to come to some kind of arrangement uh, and something has been accepted by teaching unions, whereas tomorrow teachers in England, as well as other workers, are going to be out and strike. And, you know, it might be a bit of a mixture, you know, in terms of the economy that Prestwick Airport is going to make a a profit, not a huge profit, but a profit nevertheless. The marine shipyard might not. The Scott Rail is providing public service. So it is, it is something that perhaps that here in Scotland, once we get over this week, the next coming week or so on, that we would hope that that kind of progressive economic intervention continues. Yeah, very much so. I mean, just last week I met with uh, a group of unions, about 11 or 12 unions, along with the STUC, uh, and the approach of the Scottish Government is, is welcomed in, in comparison with the UK Government in terms of looking at, uh, at disputes, I suppose in terms of the, the, you know, the, the fair pay argument, in terms of that, there's a different approach from the Scottish Government as it is to the UK Government, and that approach is welcomed by, by the unions. And, and of course, the unions aren't going to agree with the Scottish Government all, all the times, but when we look at the situations we've had, the, mo the movement we've had from the Scottish Government and the, the, the willingness to discuss with unions around about disputes, that it's completely different in terms of the, the approach. So that's welcomed uh, by the unions. That was that was very clear, clearly made to myself last week when I met with uh, the STUC and a number of unions. So they welcome that approach, and you just have to compare that with with the approach down down south, and, and it's completely different. Hence, why we're in the position that we didn't see any strikes in NHS. Hence, why we've got this, uh, all the strikes now near enough resolved in terms of that. So that approach does work out. It is more a partnership. Uh, approach and, and that will continue um, and I think that will continue regardless you know who who you know, in terms of the, the first minister position and that will continue and and uh, there is that close relationship between the unions and and the SNP uh, MSP group. Indeed and moving from being in work just now to when you're allowed to stop being in work as the SNP have demanded that the British government drop planned increases in the pension age. The SNP demanded that the UK government scrap their plans to increase the pension age ahead of tomorrow's UK budget. It comes as fresh figures revealed by the House of Commons Library suggest up to 2.9 million Scottish people could be affected by the UK government's proposals to hike the UK's state pension age from 66 to 67 in 2028 and 68 by 2044. The party said that Conservative Party plans to force people to work longer, especially while pensioners in the UK have been routinely shortchanged by the British government, would be a further betrayal of Scotland's older people. Commenting on this, the SNP social justice spokesperson 
David Linden MP said the Tories should completely scrap their plans to increase the pension age, a move that would force millions of people to work even longer before getting to enjoy their retirement. Failure to do so would be a further betrayal of Scotland's older people who already, thanks to the UK government, receive one of the lowest pensions in North West Europe, have had their free TV licences revoked and are seeing unsustainable rises to their cost of living. Paul... Um, neither of us are quite at that age yet where this is going to be a tomorrow issue but certainly a today issue is looking forward and thinking I don't really want to give up work because there's every possibility I'm not going to be able to afford to live a life that is of any value or close to the one that I'm living just now and and then they're moving the goalposts so that you're going to be forced constantly to to live to to work longer, and some of the benefits, even if they were benefits of things like free TV licences, are being whipped away. It seems to be a very unfair set of circumstances. Yeah, I mean the first changes are twenty twenty eight, so you know that that's not you know you're talking less than five years away. You know that's going to impact on people now. We are still seeing the impact of the impact of uh, the changes on the wasp waspy women. Who are still campaigning for for their their rights at the moment as well, and um, when you look at the overall, I suppose package for pensioners in, in Scotland and the UK, it's very poor. As you said, it's one of the lowest pensions in Northwest Europe. We just have to look at in other independent countries, and like this, uh, Sweden, Denmark, you know, uh, Finland, Ireland, we all have higher pensions than ourselves. And politics is all about choices, you know. And when you look at the money that that that's lost. And tax evasion each year you know if they went after tax evasion in terms of that seriously you know it's all about priorities you know and and you're right the overall support you know be it the highest the cost of living through um gas and electricity prices uh, in terms of food inflation and so on and um, it, it proportionally impacts more on elderly people because of course their level of income is, is lower than it was when they were previously working so yeah that that whole overall package is is very is very poor we're seeing more pensioners in poverty now than we ever have um, and particularly in poorer poor areas and that does impact um subsequently through into the to the to the health so it, it doesn't at longer term it, it, it doesn't you know doesn't help financially and longer term it certainly doesn't help in terms of health health benefits either and we were talking about this on on sunday's program about the the budget this week and the major plank would appear to be that the Westminster government are talking about encouraging the disabled, the over 50s, the single parents back into some kind of employment. And they seem to believe that the recovery of the economy is based on developing some kind of relationship with the infirm, the unable, the skint, and those who have more prior, better priorities on their table and it, it, it doesn't seem to be a platform for any kind of success but it seems to be more like a platform to push these people further and deeper into poverty yeah i mean the, the, there's when you look at the the um the labor shortage at the moment that's been caused by by brexit almost overnight the uk lost 1.8 million people that's figures according to the office, uh, office of national statistics if you take scotland share the population you're talking about scotland losing about 150,000 people to the labor market because of because of brexit pure and simple you know, and now we're suffering because of that there are businesses in my own area and other areas that can you know that can um, open up fully that can provide care because there's not enough people going about because of the ridiculous policies of the uk government and uh, to deny people in europe the, the ability to work over here in scotland and you know, excuse me. What we need to see, obviously, in terms of that, is Scotland. Scotland needs, at the very minimum, at this stage, control over its its immigration policy, so we can attract workers back into Scotland, and 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 look around about how we can, you know, support the companies that need need the workers just now. I mean, Scotland's uh, employment statistics come out, and they were the lowest that they've ever been. But what it doesn't show is is under capacity that some of our businesses are at, at the moment because they can't recruit people in terms of that. So that's impacting on Scottish businesses just now. It's impacting on the viability of, of businesses and it's impacting obviously in areas who can't recruit people to come in. But this is this has been self inflicted damage by the UK government because of Brexit, full stop. And as you said, they're desperately now trying to get people to come back into employment um, in terms of that. And yet they're penalising them when people aren't working because of the, the lowest level of pensions in Western Europe. 
then we move from migration off to asylum seekers as today asylum seekers have won permission to challenge the UK government's Rwanda policy in the appeal court. A court of appeal judge has ruled that a group of asylum seekers can bring a legal challenge against the Home Office for what they claim has been a failure to consider the dangers and risks of deporting them to Rwanda. Lord Justice Underhill, the Vice President of the Court of Appeal Civil Division, has granted this permission for the group to appeal against the British government's controversial policy on some grounds. Ten asylum seekers from a range of conflict zones, which have included Iran, Iraq and Syria, are involved in the legal challenge. They have all been threatened with removal to Rwanda. Today's judgment considered whether the High Court had properly examined whether Rwanda is safe as a place to send asylum seekers to, especially in the light of grave warnings given to the court by the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, about the country's poor track record of protecting refugees. In December, judges found the government's policy was lawful overall, but quashed the Home Office's decision to deport eight people selected to transfer to the Rwandan cap capital, Kigali. Well, today's ruling granted the asylum seekers appeal on some points other grounds were rejected, such as the claim made by one man that his treatment by people smugglers on his journey to the UK amounted to being trafficked. The ruling was welcomed by those challenging the Rwanda policy. Sophie Lucas, a solicitor at Duncan Lewis, said... We welcome the Court of Appeal's decision to grant permission on our outstanding grounds of appeal. We maintain that the Home Secretary failed to conduct a thorough examination of the functioning of Rwanda's asylum system, as required by law. There are crucial evidential gaps and deficiencies. The Rwanda policy is not compatible with fundamental human rights afforded to asylum seekers under the European Convention on Human Rights, to which the United Kingdom was the first signatory and also the Refugee Convention. I suppose, in a sense, um, it would be flippant to suggest if you could get a court of appeal against a Supreme Court a decision, there may be hope for somebody to go back from an earlier Supreme Court decision with regards to referenda. But on this, the flippancy would be not correct. The Rwandan policy, surely... It's immoral, it causes BBC presenters to get their knickers in a twist, it creates discord amongst everybody. Surely somebody somewhere has got to be able to stop this nonsense. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this is about, most of the times I'm on here, Don, we're talking about this issue and, and it's around about the, the, the courts given the right of appeal. And, and I, I think this is a deliberate tactic. I, I think we're... We're probably 15 to 18 months away from a UK election. I think this is the UK government trying to play to its right wing base. In terms of that, no one find the court cases might go through a period of time, but they can claim that they're trying to stand up um, for the rights of, of people that, that, that support them. In terms of that, and we just have to look at the situation last week in terms of the the, the abhorrent messaging. You know, stop the boats, stop the refugees coming in, and the UNHCR again. Have, have said that the, the situation around about trying to stop the boats, again, is illegal, as it did in, in Rwanda. So we've got the UNHCR saying time after time after time that UK government policy is, is, is illegal. It's not just illegal, it's, it's abhorrent, it's immoral, it's cruel, it gives people who, who have that, 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 that right to asylum almost no way to go in, in the UK. It's absolutely abhorrent the way that UK government is going down this, this route. And to be totally honest, I, I listened last week to Yvette Cooper as well from the Labour Party talking around about the principle of the, of the I suppose, of the policy. She didn't condone the language that was used. She didn't condone some of the policies that was there. It was more around about it wouldn't work. So she supported the policy, but didn't think it would work in this current form. So it's abhorrent. You know, both the main UK parties support this approach because what they're trying to do is fight for the blue wall, red wall, whatever you want to call it, in the north of England, where they think they'll win a UK election or not. They don't care how immoral or abhorrent this policy is or end about people actually dying because they can't get it into the UK, the people who deserve that chance for another life because of the, the life that they're suffering at the moment. I suppose that the 
one of the areas that doesn't get highlighted is the fact that the United Kingdom take in less than most of the other European countries do, that what we are guilty of is being quite paltry in our welcome for people who are fleeing the most appalling sets of circumstances. And with everything, of course we know that in amongst those who are likely to arrive in our shores, there may be people who arrive for reasons which are not particularly wholesome. But in amongst the people we're talking about, they are potentially the most vulnerable human beings on this planet because they're yeah. fleeing from war. You're spot on. I mean, I think in, in terms of the, the asylum, you know, I think when you look at the UK and its approach, it does take less than most other countries, way, way less than, than other countries. And of course, there's there has to be controls over legal asylum, but we're not talking about legal asylum. What the UNHCR last week almost said that the UK has would have no no um, avenues open to people who are genuinely seeking asylum, and that, that that's a ridiculous position to be in. And you know, we, we've looked at the situation, for example, in, in, with the Ukraine war. Scotland has around about twenty percent of refugees who come across from Ukraine, despite having about eight percent of the population. We have twenty percent of the refugees that it came across. So you know, Scotland has a completely different approach. It's done that in in wars, and for example, we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, Scotland has more than taken its fair share and in, in, in historically does that. And, and and you know, on the other end, the UK historically takes way less than other countries in in, in Europe who are, who are much heavily much more heavily impacted on. On that, but the the, the the policy, as I said, it's a political choice, but it's it's affecting people. It's abhorrent. It's immoral, and it's cruel. Indeed, and we go from one institution, the courts, to another institution in terms of the United Kingdom, where, rather unsurprisingly, today Ofcom has told the BBC that it needs to update its social media guidelines. According to Ofcom's chief executive, he has told MPs after the row over Gary Lineker's tweets that there is a need for the BBC to update social media guidelines for the modern world. Although the corporation's editorial guidelines are ultimately outside of Ofcom, Ofcom's remit, Dame Melanie Dawes, the regulator's chief executive, said that the row cut to the heart of questions about its editorial independence. They need to look at those guidelines and see whether they are still right in a world of increasing use of social media and look again at what they ask of contributors as well as their staff. Dawes told the Molten Commons Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee. There needs to be very strict rules for news presenters, but once you're looking beyond that, questions of freedom of expression do become relevant. The BBC board needs to work out how they draw that line to safeguard the reputation of the BBC, including for impartiality. Dawes had consulted the BBC Director General Tim Davey a couple of times over the weekend, she revealed, just to find out where they were, but ultimately gave the executive, who has come under his own accusations of bias because of his history as a local Conservative Party Deputy Chair, her seal of approval. Asked by the Scottish National Party's John Nicholson whether he could survive as Director General, she said he thought he had been very effective. It is a hugely difficult job, she continued. The BBC have not had a great week, clearly. They are trying to find their way forward, and I hope that's what they managed to do. However, the Ofcom boss declined to give the same backing to the BBC chair, Richard Sharp, who has similarly come under fire for his role in arranging an £800,000 personal loan to Boris Johnson while Johnson was Prime Minister. I don't think I can comment on individuals like that, Dawes said, adding that Ofcom doesn't have any role on BBC appointments. Dawes also committed to looking into a GB News decision to broadcast two sitting Conservative MPs, Esther McVeigh and Philip Davis, interviewing the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt on the Saturday before the budget, citing Ofcom rules that say no politician may be used as an interviewer or a reporter on any news programmes unless exceptionally or editorially justified. Nicholson asked how the TV channel could be in compliance. It's been a a bit of a weekend for the old sport 
in terms of who's likely to present and who's not going to take over. And we end up back where we were at the beginning because Lineker's coming back at this weekend, rightly so, and his tweet has been very sweet and it's been very good. And he's also challenged Elon Musk because his son received some form of threat over Twitter as well. So the, the sort of fallout from this seems not just toxic for the BBC and in a sense, hopefully quite toxic for some within the BBC, but it seems to be rumbling on, not going away, because it's a farce. Yeah, I, I think there's a few things. One, one, it does it does expose enough. You know, they, they picked it up. I've come picked it up in terms of their, their social media policy. I think that's that's certainly something to look at. And, and you see the, the the sheer hypocrisy of, of that position because we've had the situation that you've seen Alan Sugar come out and criticise uh, decisions made politically. You've seen Andrew Neil, who, while, while presenting a politics show, openly coming out and criticising the SNP and Scottish independence. Not not a thing was said to either one of them in terms of that. So there's sheer hypocrisy in, in, that, in that regard. And I think it does expose that the BBC does need to, to, to look at that and, and how that comes across as well. And I think you're right in terms of the broader debate around about where the BBC sits and impartiality, then I think that's that's incredibly important. We've seen, as you mentioned, the BBC chairman and the loan to, to Boris Johnson. That that can't that can't be right. That that just can't can't be right. You know, it needs to be impartial in in, in that regard. And, and you're right when you see the likes of the, the GB News and so on using Tory MPs to interview each other, it becomes ridiculous. It really becomes ridiculous. It becomes almost Fox News esque in the UK and that's you know that certainly that's what I would compare GB News to is, is Fox News in terms of that so you know that that becomes to ridiculous position in terms of that so it's quite right that the people are speaking out against it and should be the right of, of you know speaking out against the abhorrent policy we just talked about that the asylum policy and, and Gary, Gary Lineker was quite right in, in doing that and we've seen the situation Donald before that the BBC had no problems no problems at all when Gary Lineker hosted the World Cup talking about Qatari human rights yet as soon as he talks about about human rights and asylum in the UK they take him off the air so you know there's hypocrisy all the way through in terms of that so they need to make sure they're seen as impartial as, as possible and they need, to, they need they need an internal review about how they look to deal with this because they've got egg in their face and the, and on the back of this they made the wrong decision and that was seen by the the, 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 the widespread support for Gary Lineker and quite rightly over the weekend Indeed, and, and it, it leads us into that whole thing because those of us who do cherish elements of the BBC and believe that a public sector broadcaster is very, very important and, and holding some form of impartiality. And I, I think, as many politicians do, they have no issue with being held to account in a fair and proper process. And there is a belief, I believe, amongst the vast majority of politicians that not just the committee system in order to hold them to account, but also that the, the wider public have the right to question and indeed scrutinise elements of their policies and behaviour and so on. And I, I, I don't get a sense through the majority of them that anything that's fair is going to be challenged. But this, in a sense, and I think that one of the things that was quite telling I think it was the chairman. It may well have. Been. It's very difficult to separate the two out as to who's who. It's about Ian Duncan Smith. You never knew who, whether it was Ian Duncan or Duncan Smith. And I think that what has happened there is he was challenged over the Lineker tweet to say what would have happened if Gary Lineker had been in support of the government. Yeah. And his answer was, I'm not going to answer that. Yeah. Well, surely somebody has to. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems a fair question. You know, and, and you know, if that was the case, I mean, for me, that's almost a giveaway in terms of you know, it had to be very clear. If Gary Lineker is going to come out um, and and support of the UK government position, I, I I don't think that would have happened. But as I said, you see the hypocrisy of, of Andrew Neil, of Alan Sugar, and if Gary Lineker, you know, I suppose being allowed to say what he said around about, and again, quite rightly, about the the Qatari human rights issue, it, it just showed hypocrisy about what had gone before and what you know what. Because it was criticism of the UK government, what happened to with Gary Lineker, and, and the BBC seen the backlash of that. And you're quite right. I mean, the BBC should be held to account by either the, the Scottish Parliament, obviously by the licence pair, 
and obviously by by Ofcom themselves in, in terms of that, they need to be held to account. And we've seen the whole debate previously around about you know, Nadine Doris was talking obviously around about Channel Four, um, and we, you know every country needs a, an impartial public service broadcaster, uh, be that through either the BBC or, or Channel Four to a certain degree as well. We need that. That's needed for a healthy democracy. If we don't have that, you know you really are starting to go down a slippery slope in, in that regard. If we don't have that, so I'm I'm pleased. The Ofcom are saying they should be reviewing their social media policy because that impartiality, impartiality, and it's hard at times, I appreciate that, needs to be held core to what the BBC is there to deliver. Indeed, and moving from uh, the BBC on to a more pluralistic and indeed progressive society has been very much in focus today. As the Scottish Greens have said, there is no place for conversion practices in a progressive Scotland. In a statement on LGBT conversion practices, the Scottish Greens co-leader, Patrick Harvey, MSP, has called anti-LGBTQ plus conversion practices abhorrent and abusive by nature and insisted there is no such thing as a non-coercive conversion practice and never can be. Mr Harvey said anyone who argues that people should be able to consent to this form of abuse is clearly failing to understand the issue. Nobody should be told that they are not good enough or that they should be ashamed of who they are. In the Butte House agreement between the Scottish Greens and the Scottish Government, there is a commitment to a watertight ban on all conversion practices. Mr Harvey said that this, that uh, that is what the Scottish Greens believe in and is the commitment they would seek from any new First Minister. Mr Harvey went on to warn that anything less than a full and unequivocal ban would go against that agreement, which was overwhelmingly supported by the membership of both parties. Equality is and always will be central to our party and our vision for Scotland. He said, Paul, I suppose there's th this Butte House agreement in terms of the Scottish Greens. They're certainly depending upon who comes out of this election contest. Either a nod of agreement, a discussion around it, or a redrawing of it, depending on who may come through this particular contest. Is this the Scottish Greens making a play and saying, this is what we stand for? I know that the Scottish Greens have actually moved away from the British Green Party because of differences over transgender debating and, and, and policy. Is this the Scottish Greens basically setting out a manifesto for government that the new leader may well have to take account of? I, I, I don't think it is. I, I fully agree with the statement that, that, that Patrick Harvey's made. And, and I'm not talking because of the Butte House Agreement. I'm talking about conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is wrong. It, it, it needs to end as soon as possible. It needs to be legal as soon as possible. Um, in, in this day and age, you know, it, it just there's no place for it. There's absolutely no place for it. You know, people are who they are. They choose to be who they are in, in, in terms of this. You know, when people are born, they're, they're born the way they are. And we should appreciate that and understand that in, in terms of that. And so I, I don't believe the Greens are making a play for that. I do, totally agree by the point that Patrick Harvey made, we need to end conversion therapy as soon as possible. Um, and I fully agree with that. So, and the Greens have been consistent, as have the vast majority of the membership of the SNP and the vast majority of, if not all, MSPs in the SNP group. So I support Patrick Harvey in, in his position coming out and saying that. I support that that needs to be part of the Butte House Agreement. Um, and, and it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We need to end conversion therapy as soon as possible. And I suppose, in a sense, we can look at the voting in Holyrood over the Gender Recognition Reform Act and see the wide, broad consensus of MSPs as well. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think there's there, there's a bigger issue. I mean, obviously, in terms of GRR, where that sits at the moment, Section 35, and you know, over two thirds of the Parliament vote for that with every party, every uh, party voting for that. You know, MSPs from every party voting for that. Um, I think the conversion therapy is, is a different matter. Um, I, I voted for the GRR and, and proudly voted for the GRR and would, would, would do it again. In terms of conversion therapy, I think you'd see an even bigger majority in terms of that if that came to Parliament. But that's the right thing to do. We, you know, we can't, we can't convert people. We can't convert their sexuality. We can't convert who they are. And, and that's the fundamental thing, I think, for me in terms of that. So it's the right... Patrick Harvey said the right thing. It's the right thing to do. 
and Scotland needs to move towards ending conversion therapy as soon as it possibly can. And we move from the right thing to do to the wrong thing to do in Poland as Polish court has convicted an activist for helping women get abortion pills. A court in Poland has convicted this activist for helping a pregnant woman access abortion pills, sentencing her to eight months of community service in a landmark case over abortion rights in the country, which is governed by the socially conservative Law and Justice Party. Along with Malta, Poland's anti-abortion laws are amongst the most restrictive in Europe, allowing for termination only in the event of incest, rape or a risk to the mother's health. Helping a woman obtain an abortion is also illegal. Justina Wydzierzynska told the court in Warsaw that she had sent pills to a woman who was a victim of domestic violence, according to Facebook, page, a Facebook page of the pressure group Abortion Dream Team, of which she is a member. The woman had called an abortion line asking for help with terminating her pregnancy. Activists revert uh, Virginska to the case after which she mailed drugs she already had at home to her. When the woman's partner found out, he called the police who intercepted the pills. Amnesty International and other campaign groups say the case is the first of its kind in Europe. Kaina Yoshida, a senior legal advisor at the Centre for Reproductive Rights, said in a statement, her prosecution sets a dangerous precedent for the targeting of human rights defenders in Poland who are working to advance reproductive rights and challenge Poland's de facto ban on abortion. <coughs> Excuse me. Agnes Kalamard, the Secretary General of Amnesty International, added, Today's conviction marks a depressing low in the repression of reproductive rights in Poland, a rollback for which women and girls and those who defend their rights are paying a high price. Price. Paul, I think as we move forward, it's always interesting to look across to wherever. Wade versus Roe in America, the very conservative changes that are happening there, the liberalisation that's happened in Ireland over the last decade or 20 years, the progress that's happened there, but then you look to Central Europe, Poland, Hungary, Italy, Sweden, even the Netherlands as well, all seem to have parties of the right, very similar in a dog-whistling sense, one might even suggest, to what they have. We're talking about the red wall or the blue wall seats in the UK. We shouldn't be complacent at all. But this seems to be a very worrying prospect for women's rights across the central belt of Europe. Yeah, it's Donald. I think we're seeing a, a rollback. And, you know, he mentioned about Roe versus Wade in the, in the States and the position of right-wing politics in, in terms of that, and that, that's deeply worrying, and we'll see where that one goes in terms of what each of the individual states do. Um, if you look, as you said, towards Poland and right-wing governments in, in, um, in Hungary, uh, you mentioned obviously about Malta uh, as well, and the right-wing governments in, in Italy, there does seem to be a, ro a, a rollback in terms of women's right to choose, and that's the most important thing, women's right to choose. It's a woman's body. She should decide to what she wants to do with her body. That's the fundamental right that should be protected, um, not in, in terms of, and again, I think when you see, it, it's almost driven by populist politics, be that in Poland, be that in Hungary, be that in Italy, it's driven by populist politics. And, and you, poll after poll after poll, when you look in, in each of these countries, if you actually ask the women who are of reproductive age, they are strongly, strongly in support of their right to choose. Yet the decisions are made by men, are made by women who are older in, in the childbearing age, and impacts on, on people who then have to suffer the consequences in terms of that. Women should have the right to choose, and that should be a basic, a basic human fundamental right in terms of that. And you know, and I'm not surprised I'm this near coming out and, and saying that it is a worrying trend. And we need to defend the right of women to choose what they do with their bodies. Indeed, people of an elderly age deciding the policy for the rest of us would never happen in this country when deciding who's going to be the Prime Minister. However, yeah. better news today with the Scottish Government announcing funding for local climate action hubs. Local communities across Scotland are to be supported to take climate action in their areas through a new network, nationwide network of climate action hubs. This follows the success of two Pathfinder hubs in the North East and the Highlands 
which helped to widen participation in climate action and have supported a range of projects, including on local energy and flood mitigation. A total of £4.3 million will be allocated to expand the Scottish Government's Climate Action Hub programme to around 20 communities across the country. Net Zero Secretary Michael Matheson said our national climate change targets, as passed almost unanimously by the Scottish Parliament, are our collective responsibility and meeting them will require action at all levels. Local communities have a major role to play in delivering our shared Net Zero agenda and I want to make sure that we support and enable that action. That is why we are expanding our successful climate action programme to create a national network of hubs. This place-based approach will put communities at the heart of the transition to net zero and help ensure that everyone has a say in how Scotland responds to the climate crisis. Paul, I find this quite kind of fascinating because internationally, climate crisis and the environment is a huge topic. And yet some of the very simple things that one person does within a community, which leads to a number of people doing the same, which begins a movement and starts a progressive difference to where they live, can end up having huge benefits to the whole community. And this seems like yeah. absolutely brilliant. Uh, Don, st strongly support it. I mean, I was elected as a council back in 2007, about 2008, um, I became a trustee of an organisation called Sustain and Dunbar. And Sustain and Dunbar was looking at initiatives that we're talking about now way back uh, way back then uh, in terms of that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's changed the mentality of the community. It's changed, you know, what the community needs to do to terms to meet the climate change challenges. And we've seen organisations such as Sustain and Dunbar, there's Climate Action East Lothian, which is an umbrella group in East Lothian in my constituency, um, bring together an action plan for the, all the groups in East Lothian. And, and there are various projects ongoing just now, and it needs to be local-based solutions. You know, the solutions that are needed in East Lothian will be different to what's needed in Glasgow, what's needed in Dundee, what's needed in, in the Highlands. So that, that local approach is, is, is really um, is, is really needed. In terms of the, the funding for the, the hubs, I think that's incredibly important because the feedback from some of these organisations over a number of years was that they could do so much, but they needed that additional funding just to try and, uh, you know, to, to move them on and to try and achieve more and where they're just now. So there needs to be local solutions within a national Scottish framework in terms of that. And once these, I suppose, solutions and, and, and you know, and initiatives start, then we need to look at funding. There was just a debate this afternoon in the Parliament talking around about how local authorities can assist local com local communities with Scottish Government and attracting funding in around about retrofit and around about uh, de decarbonising buildings and so on. So there's much to be done. Um, but there's lots of uh, communities can do, working with local authorities, working with Scottish Government, and then bringing in external funders as well to make sure that we deliver the change that we need to. We need to be net zero by 2045. It's 22 years away. It sounds a long time. It's not. We need to be making much quicker progress than we are just now, and I think this is a, a good step in, in that direction. Right, absolutely right, because you know, in terms of biodiversity as well, I I would imagine that what's needed in certain areas is going to be very different to what's yeah. needed elsewhere, and and also the building is very present just now, given what has been happening down south and cladding and and you know flammable yeah. materials. That actually moving to a point where and I can't remember where it was. I remember watching a program where there was a series of houses where the heating's never on. Because the way in which they were built in the UK means that they're always warm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that there are innovative solutions out there to what we're struggling with. Uh, it was quite interesting. I'm on the local government committee and we were looking at retrofitting and decarbonised buildings. We went through to a building in Glasgow. It was like a, a tester a project through in Glasgow. And it was a tenement, about eight flats, and, and it was insulated. There was heating systems. They reckon they could keep the heating to ten pounds a month, wow. uh, quite easily. That's been tested to be ten pounds a month through insulation, through heating systems, uh, in terms of that. So you know, first of all, we need to insulate the buildings as best we can and look at alternative heating systems uh, going forward. So that debate is continuing, um, but it, it, it you know it does make a difference, not just in terms of climate change. It can make a difference in terms of fuel poverty. There are far, far too many people in fuel poverty as well in terms of that. So it's imperative that we move on as, as quick as possible. That, but there are projects that are demonstrating 
that we can we can insulate um, a, a reasonable price, we can heat at a reasonable price. And I said, that's good for the planet. It's good for jobs as well, because there's much work to be done in terms of that. And it's certainly good for tackling fuel poverty. There's far too many people are dying in Scotland because of fuel poverty. In the richest country, one of the richest countries in, 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 in Europe, in the world, in terms of energy production. Indeed. And good news today for people like me who have got two students living in the house, as the Scottish Government has increased financial support for students. Financial support announced today available to undergraduate students will rise by £900 from the start of the 2023-24 academic year. Estranged students in higher education and other undergraduate learners with the lowest household income will see their maximum support package increase from 8100 to £9,000 per annum, as the ceiling for all student loan applications is uplifted by £900. The annual non-repayable care experience bursary for eligible higher education students will also increase to £9,000. In FE, a £900 increase will also be applied to the maximum bursary rate available to care experienced students. These increases will be available to students already at college and university and for new students beginning their studies from autumn 2023. Students in need of immediate financial support for the 2022-23 academic year are still able to apply for their college or university for assistance through their discretionary funds. Higher and Further Education Minister Jamie Hepburn said this rise in support will help to alleviate the financial pressures facing many students as we grapple with the cost of living in crisis. Sorry. The maximum financial support package available to the most vulnerable students and those from the lowest household incomes in higher education will rise to £9,000. This is the next step in delivering our commitment to provide a total package of student support equivalent to the living wage. Increasing the care experience bursary will help more of Scotland's care experience community to access further in higher education and fulfil their potential. Now, Paul, I'm going to declare an interest here, not as somebody who's got two students at home, but my job, my day job, is I am uh, responsible for the education of over 50 children and young people in care. The care experience bursary has made an exceptional difference. Now, I've done that job for nearly a decade. And the difference between encouraging children and young people from a care experience background when I started to go into college to now is night and day. This has made a significant difference to pushing them into a position, not only that they wish to progress their education, but they feel that they can, which then has another part of that implication, which is they're going to be independent at some point. They're going to want to find a tenancy, move out from our care, and be placed in a position where they can survive. And this makes a significant difference to their lives. So this seems to me a no-brainer. Yeah, we we already, we already have the 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 the, uh, the strongest support package for students in in UK by a considerable margin. I, I've had um, cases when I was a counsellor and as an MSP as well about care and, uh, the care experience bursary, and and it changed lives. It it, it changes lives, and I'm, it's not trying to be cliche. It it changes lives and and offers that life chances in, in terms of there. And, and as you said, you know, obviously two students, but your own. My kids now are thirty and twenty five, and went to the uni at Stirling and, and, and Strathclyde and without the support um, I couldn't have managed in, in terms of that. There's no way we could have managed at that particular time. So, you know, my kids are in a strong position because of the support they get from Scottish Government. Um, and I said it's the strongest support package for students in the UK by a considerable margin. But coming back to the point you made about care experience bursary, it, it, change, it literally changes lives um, you know, by the opportunities it gives people to, you know, to fulfil fulfill their potential. And that's the key thing, and, and we're seeing that now. And I'm delighted that the Scottish Government have managed to, to increase that in the most difficult of times financially that we've had in, in the budget settlement for a long, long period of time. Indeed, and we end tonight with uh, news that a baby loss memorial book for those who have experienced a pregnancy or baby loss prior to 24 weeks will be available this summer, according to current First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. Along with an entry in the book, those who have experienced a loss will be able to apply for a commemorative certificate 
which is intended to give recognition and comfort to those who want to record their loss. The service will be free of charge and completely voluntary. Applications to have an entry included in the book produced jointly by the Scottish Government and National Records of Scotland will go live this summer. Making the announcement, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said, The loss of a pregnancy or a baby is always painful. I have spoken in the past about my personal experience of miscarriage and I know the sense of grief will stay with me and my husband forever. I also know that we would have drawn comfort at the time if there had been a way for us to mark the loss and formally recognise the child we were grieving. Launching this memorial book with the National Records of Scotland will give parents an opportunity if they wish it to commemorate their loss with a physical record and to have their child recognised. Paul, I think there's probably two questions that arise from this. First of all is, it's of course absolutely correct and right that the state should find a way of commemorating those children and young people lost to their parents in this manner. But there's also the other thing, I think, which is Nicola Sturgeon did refer to her own personal yeah. experiences. But this is something very close to her. Um, and one wonders if things like this, the transgender debate and so on, that once the baton is passed over to whomsoever, shall we see Nicola Sturgeon more, more often fronting campaigns and campaigning for what she believes in? I think we may see that. And, and I think the First Minister has, has, has talked about her experiences, bravely talked about her experiences in, in, in the past. And j just during the summer, I visited a, a, a charity in Edinburgh called Health in Our Hearts, who are a, a, choice, uh, a charity for baby loss uh, parents and so on. And the work they, they've done moved me to tears. It, it was incredible, absolutely incredible, the work they've done. And, you know, I, I think. No, I'm hosting them in the Parliament. They're going to be having a, a, an exhibition in the Parliament and also organising a round table in May, uh, including with the Cabinet Secretary, Hamza Youssef, and, and, and NHS boards talking about a framework for, for baby loss and how does that and, and how that you know that applies across Scotland at the moment. It's very mixed. So that's something that I'll be hosting in May along with Held in Our Hearts, the Baby Loss Charity, uh, Hamza Youssef, the Cabinet Secretary, and NHS boards throughout Scotland to try and bring that that consistent approach and that framework that's there. So, but the, the work they do is incredible. The, the the loss of a baby is something you know which must be incredible to to, to incredibly hard to uh, to bear. But you know the work they do was it was absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. And I'll be glad to work working with them in the months ahead to try and get that framework and as best support for families beyond the baby loss because there's much there's much work to be done with families beyond that when they lose they lose the baby and, and I think that's that's what we need to see more of a framework in Scotland and I'm, I'll be glad I'm working with them in that regard. Indeed and it's that kind of joint working we've referred to elsewhere tonight in terms of how that is delivered and put together and joined by a government rather than is criticised by a government pointed yeah. at because you're yeah. not doing well enough and that that's fantastic well that's all we've got time for this evening, I, I start by thanking very much, Paul, for you being here tonight. As always, uh, a joy to have you, and indeed, lots of great stuff that we managed to get through and indeed discuss. So thank you. No, no, it's always a pleasure, always a pleasure to be on. Thank you, Paul. So before I go, and you know what's coming, so don't turn off. I just want to remind you that here at Broadcasting Scotland, we depend on the generosity of supporters. So to everyone who has donated... Thank you. And to everyone who has signed up to make a regular monthly payment, thank you very much indeed. We've made a commitment that our programmes will always be free to view. However, if you can afford £5 a month, please consider becoming a broadcasting supporter. And also, if you're on social media, please do us a favour and tweet this round, send it on Instagram, send it on whatever platform you are on, old or new. Because the more people that get the opportunity to see what we do, the greater possibility there is that we're going to build some kind of support network. And that would include people volunteering for us and coming to help either behind the scenes or indeed be in the face now and again of what we do.
We have set ourselves a fairly ambitious target of adding 10,000 new subscribers to enable us to employ staff to make more programmes, but that could be achievable if we just got people involved in helping us out. As I said earlier on tonight, when it comes to the environment, one person doing something, somebody else sees the value of it before you know you have a movement. So come and join us and make it more of a, moment, a movement. But for tonight, from me, Donald C. Stewart, and indeed from my guest, Paul McLennan, it's good night, and thank you for watching. Night.